From the news team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday. Welcome back to the reopening series. This week, we're on to our third of six big questions about what we want from work. This one's super practical. Now that a lot of us are back in person, at least sometimes, how do we talk to our colleagues again? I don't think it's possible to overestimate how challenging it's going to be to figure out a new office culture. We didn't leave offices. Offices left us. They were, for a time, a dangerous idea. Gathering in any way was. And beyond quarantine itself, our grief and loss wasn't only focused on COVID-19. We felt it in the loss of Black lives to police violence. And through all of that, we also, some of us, we started new jobs and welcomed new colleagues. It was all just so much. So how do you make small talk after that? I called the very best person I could think of to advise us on this, Esther Perel. Esther's a couples therapist, an expert on relationships and relating. Perhaps you've heard our podcasts, Where Should We Begin and How's Work? Well, today is really all about workplace relationships. Here's Esther. The collective grief sits on top of a few other things, right? The first thing has been a prolonged sense of uncertainty. Um, and a prolonged sense of uncertainty means that we still actually are uncertain about when the uncertainty will end. But we live in a society that primes mastery and that experiences mastery as a form of control over destiny. And it is very challenging for people who live by that ethos to understand and to grapple, not understand, to grapple, to tolerate uncertainty. You know, one of the very interesting findings after 9-11 was that the people who came down the towers and were there to speak about their experiences, those who lived with the notion of things happen, did much better mental health-wise than those who live with the notion of you make things happen, life is in your hand, you control destiny. In the, in, in the sense of the resilience, the ability to bounce back in the notion of I did the best I could with, with the circumstances that I could not control is very different than those people who think that you can shape the circumstances. So right. we have prolonged uncertainty. With that, we have the collective grief. And when I talk about collective grief, it is the notion of not just the physical loss of real life. It is the loss of normalcy as we knew it. It is the loss of our references as we relied on them. It is the fact that this is a collective trauma and that we tend to narrate trauma in this country very much from an individual point of view and that that kind of experience demands mass mutual reliance to not just let's move on. This let's move on thing, you know, that is very much a part of America's effort optimism that you can roll up your sleeve and just get right back in there and get to work is often accompanied by a lot of other substances <laughs> that are meant to tame and mute all the inner rumblings and fears and pains that roil inside of us in order to just be stoic. So then comes the notion of ambiguous loss. It's not that we left the office, but the office that we used to rely on, that was an equalizer for many of us, that was a place where we could actually go and experience some sense of competence, uh, a mastery, autonomy, etc., collaboration, community, um, mentorship, um, belonging, all of what work means today in that sense. Ambiguous loss is a term that was developed by Pauline Boss. It's a very, very important term because what she talked about was what happens in situations like, for example, where people are still physically present, but psychologically gone, like in Alzheimer? You can't really resolve the grief because the loss isn't complete. Or people who have disappeared but, or are in war, they are physically gone, but they are emotionally and psychologically very present. The towers of the offices are standing. They are physically present but they are hollow inside. The streets of Midtown in most cities where those towers are have become, you know, empty zones. One day everything stopped 
By the way, everything stopped by people telling you that you were going home for the weekend to see if the digital and the remote worked. Then you were told right. you're going to stay home for two weeks and then you never came back. And that is the prolonged uncertainty too. And these experiences to me describe a little bit the, the social context that is pervasive to our sense of mental health and mental wellness at this moment or emotional wellness. You know, Esther, I have just started coming back to our office in the Empire State Building. And a couple of things have been very surprising to me. One is I didn't exactly know how to talk to people again. And I walked in and one of my first interactions, I saw somebody who I know lightly, right? I haven't seen him or thought about them in a year and a half, quite honestly. And there we were next to each other. And he said to me, so how was your pandemic? And it was the most grating thing. I can't describe it. I didn't know what to say or how to answer. It felt at, at once both too deep a question to give a stranger an answer to and also too shallow a question to deign to answer. How are we supposed to navigate those interactions? What did you do? I said, oh, well, you know, how are you supposed to answer that? It was, it was kind of awful, but here we are, and what do you want for breakfast? I think that what's interesting is that there was, in the way you say it anyway, he was trying to make a kind of a light of it. Like, yeah. it's manageable. It's a finite amount of issues that we need to deal with. And not, it is an existential upheaval. It is a reorganization of our priorities. It is the task of what we often call effort optimism um, and, and particularly tragic optimism. You know the term of Viktor Frankl, tragic optimism? How did people continue to find meaning and hope in all of what they were doing? So I think um, sometimes an answer is very much, um, it was a reorganization of my life. It led me to some very deep thinking. I lost some very dear people. I am actually really feeling very strange that I am here because there were moments where I wasn't sure that I would ever come back to this office. Um, I notice how you wish that one could create a beautiful bow tie to your question and just give yeah. you a snappy one sentence. I wish I could. I'm not there yet. I don't think we will ever be. That's a beautiful answer, Esther. I wish I had had it at the tip of my tongue. <laughs> But it's also an answer that, at least before, before the pandemic, was the kind of answer I'd reserve for my friends and people who I felt I knew well Correct. or knew in a personal capacity. And it strikes me that one result of what we have all been through is that it's possible that when we are in person together, we will talk to each other differently, that we will make more room for each other. And I'm just curious, like in that situation with that colleague, what's it going to take for me to start to set a new norm and feel comfortable giving an answer like that? What needs to be true about the culture of my organization? Look, you're going to have in every organization people who want to reduce this global crisis to a set of tasks They did it from the beginning by buying toilet paper and disinfectants, and they felt that they can ha handle this. They got this. And like in any situation in a company, you have those who want to talk about process and those who want to talk about outcome. You have those who want to talk about the inner experience, and you want those who want to talk about solutions. <laughs> and these live side by side. So when a person says, How was the pandemic? He was almost trying to say, hi, what did you have for breakfast? Kind of yes. Thing. <laughs> And you will say to him, you know, if you ask a healthy person, what did they have for breakfast? The answer is very simple. But if you ask a person who has just been deprived of food for the last year, what did they have for breakfast? There is no simple answer. But the beauty of it is that you, Mr actually have been deprived of the same food. Do you feel like you are able to address this already? When you ask the question, 
Is it because you're prepared to hear or is it also because you're still trying to find a way for you to address this question for yourself? Such a such an elegant point, Esther. And it makes me think about how I actually do answer the question. And the truth is I have five different answers and I cycle through them not based on who I'm speaking with, but how I feel in relation to my feelings. And by that, I mean, um, some days my answer is, it was horrible. I was sad. I felt numb. And I felt sometimes like I couldn't get out of bed. And some days my answer is, oh, well, you know, I had it pretty good compared to a lot of people. I didn't have any direct loss. I'm still employed. I've got a job. Things are going great. Mm -hmm. And there's a gradation of answers on that scale. And I think it reflects the fact that a lot of us coming back to each other, we don't, we haven't made sense for ourselves of what we've all just been through. And that's why I think that um, you will have a diversity of answers because you didn't just have one experience. And depending on the circumstances, the day, your mood, who you're talking to, who you talked to an hour before, you will be emphasizing different parts of your experience, all normal. I think what would be interesting is, you know, everybody is so obsessed with the return to normal. <laughs> there is no, we're not returning. We are coming back. Some of us transformed, some of us slightly nudged, you know, depending <laughs> on the range from a very powerful experience that we have only begun to put into words and to organize and integrate. And I think that the beauty will be if the managers are able to take time from the meetings and basically say, we're not going to pretend nothing happened and we are just back here in the office because we're all sitting in this room. We need to touch base with each other. We need to know where each body is coming back from. We need to know that some of you may have had some very painful experiences that may at times make you less focused. We may, you know, we need to know not who is coming back only, but how are you coming back? With what are you coming back? And those have small 15, 20 minute check-ins. And maybe you do them for a few weeks. And you don't get, and, and, and you just create an environment that says, you matter. You matter. We want to hear how you are. What's happened to you? What are you bringing back to? Are there different things that you need at this moment from us in order for you to do your job? And if people are not afraid, you know, there is often this notion that if you talk about something, you make it bigger, you make it more real. <laughs> you know, this is... Yeah. And the fact is that if you don't talk about something, you actually can also make it bigger and make it way more real. So acknowledge this. Are there, you know, what were the people's, what were the care systems that you experienced? Who, who did you have to take care of? You know, did you leave? Did you have to move back into your family home that you had so run away from 10 years ago? Yeah. And you're right. We're not moving forward to go back to a new normal. We're moving forward into a work circumstance that hasn't really been invented yet. We're going to invent it in real time. And sometimes we'll be in person together and sometimes we will likely still be mm -hmm. across screens from each other. Mm -hmm. Like, What do we know about the differences in the way that we relate and trust each other in one circumstance versus the other? I used to study love online. <laughs> And one of the things that we often talked about in that, in those research in, is that you know, you bypass the geographic distance, you contract that distance, and you actually can share a lot more very personal information with, you know, with people that you don't know. Um, so now we are talking about what is work online, right? How do you relate in online? I look at you right now, I'm not making any eye contact. I think I see you. I think you make eye contact with me. Every time I watch a video again, I realize where was I looking? You know, it, and therefore the mirror neurons are not operating. Usually our structure comes from changing clothes and changing location to go to our different activities. When you go to exercise, when you go to see friends, when you go to a concert, when you go to the park, 
when you go to work, you leave, you create a before and after. There is a separation in time and in space. That is really grounding structure that gives us a sense of stability and inner anchor. All of that got dissolved, completely dissolved. Coming back to the office is coming back to the restaurant, coming back to seeing people in person, is a, it will demand a reconstitution of all these boundaries, of all these structural elements of our lives that orient us. There's a reason we've been kind of exhausted. So what do we get on Zoom? A tremendous amount on Zoom or any of the devices. We, we managed to continue, you know, the very tools that pre-pandemic we were used, we were talking about them as they disconnect people, <laughs> became the very tools that we talked about how they maintain the connection between people. It's a both end, you know. At the same time, when we come together, we have everything that has to do with the human element, creativity, mentorship, collaboration, community, that notion, you know, the small talk, the humor, the, 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 the eye gazes, that entire realm of interaction, of bonding, of communicating, of learning, especially for those who were not on cruise control. You and I were on cruise control. We have already yeah. internalized a ton before we said, you know, that we could take with us. So we could kind of fill in the blanks, but people that are starting to work that have never sat in those rooms, that have never checked in with others, that don't know the norms, the culture. Culture is not just made out of a piece of paper in which it is written one, two, three, four. Those people will have an experience when they come at work that is just, you know, very different. In your show this past season, you spoke to the members of a newsroom. It's a large group, 65, 70 people. And partway through the show it emerged, it came out that the newsroom had gotten a new leader over the course of the last year, an editor-in-chief who had never physically met the people in the newsroom. Nor ever had a spontaneous moment. Every Zoom call is scheduled. You know, when you are cut off of the happenstance, of the serendipity, of the chance encounters, of the spontaneous, you are cut off of the, what I call eros, the life force, the, that energy. It's not just never having met the people. It's that he says, I've never met any one of you and I've never had a spontaneous meeting with any one of you. And you feel the, I mean, you, 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 your heart sinks, you, you experience it, that you feel that loss, you feel, how is he doing it? Yeah, entirely. But you, I interrupted you. You were going to say something. Oh, no, you didn't interrupt me at all. But it does make me think, like, there's another thing that I hadn't expected about coming back to the office. And that is, I vaguely knew this was true. But at home, now, keep in mind, Esther, I'm the mother of two very small children. I have a two-year-old and a 10-week-old. Mm -hmm. And right now, my minutes are very judiciously used. And I was able to be so productive this year. Because there was no spontaneity, there was no That's small right. talk, there was no one to run into. And as happy as I am to have all of that back, I also don't quite know how to interact with it again because it's slowing me down. And I feel very anxious about wanting to maintain my level of productivity. And my mind hasn't registered that actually this is a different kind of productivity, but also important. Does that make sense? Yes, but you are also talking to me from a particular developmental stage. You have a 10-week-old. That's a developmental stage. Part of what you're saying to me now, you would be saying to me. Yes, At that's any true. time. You understand? <laughs> that's you, true. You know, every moment is precious. And let me say something. That poetic side, that spontaneous side, that playful side, that serendipity happenstance side, you have it with your 10-week-old. A baby, an infant, and even a toddler give you that. But certainly the infant gives you that. So you, you, you get the nibbling, the tickling, the adoring gaze, the playing, the cooing. The, you're in that realm. 
And it's you. It's a mistake to think that your child rearing, that a, your child care is only productive. Your child care at this point is about bonding. It's about awe. It's about adoring. It's about protecting. And all of these things are not just in the realm of productivity. We're going to take a quick break here. When we get back, we'll talk about the impact of last year's protests and our subsequent push for social justice. And we're back with Esther Perel. Last year's social justice awakening happened while many of us were at home. It heightened conversations around equity and inclusion. So now many of us are back in person and we're trying to figure out how do we have real conversations about this at work? I'm going to piggyback on the thing we just spoke about. You, you were describing yourself as, an, as a mother of a newborn. One of the very interesting normative cultural changes has been the relationship to, from parent to child. One of the very classic ones that you can easily go to is affection actually has remained but it's the authority that has shifted, the way one manifests authority as a parent, corporal punishment, discipline, okay? Every parent today has to think how are they going to get the child to comply, to follow the rules of the home, to, to, to do what is respect, to their responsibility, etc., without abiding by norms that have been historically completely accepted and passed down across generations. So this is to give you a reference. I always look for an analogy of another place where people have had to rethink how they talk, how they deal with reality, how they organize information, how they communicate, etc. This is going to be a lot of that kind of stumbling, right? Um, and, and it is not in just having programs that come to do inclusion and diversity and equity. I get it. I think that the reckoning that is taking place around race, around class, I mean, around gender. You have a job, you manage to deal with two children and a full-time job. The amount of women who have stepped out of the workforce, you know, there are many big questions that are not always included in the conversation. And what you will see is that often people narrate their experience during the pandemic very much in terms of how they experienced it. And so they assume that that becomes the collective experience. And slowly, people are going to learn to ask questions and then to listen, because the way you listen shapes the way the other person answers. You know, a, a, a cultural shift starts with a little more hesitation. Last year, Esther launched a show called Housework. It's in its second season, and it's basically couples therapy, but for people who work together. This season, there's an episode about two friends, a white woman and a black gay man. Their friendship had pretty much blown up. As the guy says, She's my work wife, and I was a work husband, and then we got a divorce. The reasons are wrapped up in race and gender, and getting to the bottom of them, it offers a lesson in understanding how the larger dynamics of our culture are shifting our personal relationships. It's a hard episode to listen to. And at the end of the show, I didn't feel resolved. They waited for a year to come and do this episode. So they had been sitting with that. It's not that they waited to come to the, for the, the podcast, but they sat with that. They knew something isn't being addressed. They're, they're swirling around it. Um, and I think one of the most interesting pieces, and that's why you say it wasn't resolved. I actually think they resolved lots. When you think about it in terms of reconnecting, breathing space again, f reclaiming fondness for each other, really hearing. But the fundamental difference, some of the irreconcilable difference that they have, which is that she wanted his response to her to be completely rooted in their one-on-one -on -one relationship. And he basically says to her, I cannot just see you outside of the context, the bigger context of our relationship that includes primarily race in this instance. And you would like to individualize our story and our conflict and why I didn't support you. But my not supporting you is not just about you. 
It's about who I am isn't just something I define from the inside. It's also how I am perceived from the outside. Identity is a two-way process. And my behavior is scrutinized differently than your behavior. And my support of you has a larger social meaning than just our personal relationship. And he, and that is something you need to know. You may not like it. You may still wish I had stood by you. But I think you need to understand what I was deliberating with as we were going through this crisis at work. And um, some things are not reserved as in, you know, we hug each other at the end and it's a sweet little bow tie. This is not the story. The, 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 the articulation of this fundamental difference, the ability to come to terms with it and to integrate it, and to maintain the fondness is actually a part of what many polarized relationships these days, be them around racial differences, political differences, are demanding. Is the, is, is the ability to do both, see the humanity of the individual and see the larger collective meaning of what that relationship stands for in our society. And it's a gripping episode because of that, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'll tell you, I listened to it twice and not because we were talking today, but because I felt there was something in it for me to learn as I tried to navigate my interpersonal relationships in the And office. what was it? What did you glean from it? I think that the perspective of wanting to isolate an interpersonal relationship outside of the systems in which it exists is one I hold and frankly one of of privilege I think and it's more fair to realize the truth that it actually perhaps shouldn't be done and yet we can hold fondness for each other all the same but we can only hold that fondness for each other if we can trust each other. I think this is actually um, a moment like that where um, many, many, many of us are having questions about how do I talk about this? How do I bring this up? Um, is it okay if I address it, the issues like that? Should I talk about this or shouldn't I talk about it? It's a very interesting moment of reflection about what is disclosed, what is hidden, what is personal and private, what is public, what is individual and what is collective. And that is very rich. In the workplace, it so quickly looks for a solution and an answer before it has even understood what is the issue. You know, this is one yeah. of the first things people learn in conflict negotiation, right? Or any negotiation. First of all, spend some time defining what is the issue. Then brainstorm about, you know, what are the many ways that one could address this issue? Then think about what's one option that you would like to try out now and then set out to solve it. You know, sometimes... This is a moment where, you know, you act a little bit less fast. And that has happened to all of us this year. We all slowed down. Everybody was forced to slow down and people began to think and to review their priorities and their challenges and what matters to them and their values. And all of that is, by the way, walking into the office with us at this point. Yeah. <laughs> and that bit about polarization and its impact on us, it, it, it feels important too. I mean, there are so many things that have happened since we were together in the United States, an election. It feels to me like we get so consumed over those differences and often isolating and labeling and naming those differences, uh, particularly digitally, um, that we don't always have the language and the vocabulary to look for the similarities and hold them beside the differences? Look, I am a couples therapist. I am very used to polarized relationships. That is very much what we work with, is two people who have lived together for 10, 20, 30 years and have completely, completely different narratives about what is supposed to be a shared reality, a relationship. Yep. So I work with Romantic pairs, I work with families, I work with colleagues and co-founders. When people argue, when there is conflict, the tendency is to think that it is about issues. And even you, you say, let's move from the differences issues 
to the similarities issues. And I would invite you to actually say to you, the issues probably are not what people are arguing about. They actually often will argue about three hidden dimensions. And this is from the work of Howard Markman about couples, but I think it is equally so in the workplace. People will argue uh, about issues of power and control. It doesn't matter what is the narrative that they're using, if it's the meeting that they attended or didn't attend, or the, the, the input they were invited to, to join, to add or not. The issue is power and control. Whose priorities matter? Whose opinion is taken into account? Who was included or excluded? Their f- power and control, everything about that. Number two is about care and closeness. Do you have my back? Can I rely on you? Can I trust you? Are we in this together? Do we have a shared interest here? And number three, integrity and recognition. Do you value me? And if you take all the stories, you will begin to see that in the end, they can all be about one of these three things. And if you listen from that place, then the, the, then these are the human dimensions that in your book will be similarities, but they're not similarities of issues. They're similarities of what are some of the fundamental needs that human beings need in order to get along. Period. That was Esther Perel. Check out her show, How's Work. It's a show that explores the relationships that we have with our bosses, our co-founders, the folks we work with. It's revealing. And now on to our third assignment. For the past two weeks, I've asked you to reflect in a journal, and it's a powerful reflection tool. But this week, we've been talking about relationship building, so I want to do it. I'm going to ask you to make a call. Check in with a colleague, a customer, a workmate, someone you've seen more online than off this year. Forget Zoom here. Do it the old-fashioned way. Pick up the phone. And this doesn't need to be deep. I'm not asking you to have that hard conversation. The point here is to invest in the small talk as much as the big talk. Invest in the people with whom you spend your time. Consider how all of it makes you feel as you do it, and then join us for office hours on Wednesday to discuss. We'll see you at 3 p.m. Eastern as usual. And you can also find us on the LinkedIn news page or email hellomonday at linkedin.com. Sarah, Michaela, and I are going to be doing this too, and so we'll see you there. Join us next week as we explore our fourth big question in the reopening series. We'll be talking about new habits. I know I've picked up a few this year. And so now the question comes, what stays and what do we just need to get rid of? We're going to talk with Nir Ayel. He's a best-selling author on consumer psychology and healthful habits. If this episode resonates with you, please share it with a friend. And as always, your ratings and reviews help us so much. So thanks. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show was produced by Sarah Storm with help from Taisha Henry. Joe DiGiorgi mixed our show. Florencia Iriando is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is our technical director. Michaela Greer, Samantha Roberson, Carrington York, and Victoria Taylor nurture meaningful relationships with us. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. Our show's back next Monday. Thanks for listening.